welcome to discussions of music, healing, and consciousness with your hosts, Chris Noble and Bill Prosman. In today's episode, we're talking all about analog or acoustic instruments versus software or digital instruments. We'll be going into the details of both sides of the spectrum, acoustic instruments and their physical properties, emotional properties, nuances, and organic elements that you can't create any other way, versus the software instruments that have infinite amount of controls, parameters, and ways to tweak your sound. We'll be discussing the balance and merging of the two of those worlds, as well as composing or writing techniques that Bill and myself have discovered throughout our career. We'll also be dabbling a little bit in Eastern and Western philosophy and talking about the intentionality behind music, the intentionality behind writing music, specifically with analog or digital instruments. We'll be chatting about that and much, much more as always in our open conversations here on discussions of music, healing, and consciousness. You said that immediately, Bill. It brought me into a project I'm working on currently uh, with a client where we're recreating the Gregorian chant. And for those listening, a Gregorian chant is one of the most ancient, in terms of in recorded history, one of the most ancient forms of music, um, which is really all surrounding the human voice and a, in a choral sort of choir sense. When you hear a Gregorian chant, it likely will transport you into a sort of a monk monastery slash ancient, you know, cathedral yeah. church environment. That's the the vibe you definitely will feel when you listen to a Gregorian chant. So I'm now trying to write something that's replicating the human voice without having the budget to hire, you know, a 15 piece mm-hmm. choir that specifically sings a very ancient form of song like called the Gregorian chant. So what do you do? as a musician, as a composer in these, in this kind of a situation, well, you got to go for a software instrument that can emulate that kind of a sound. And, you know, for those listening, there's a really interesting divide, not a divide, but almost like two categories of musical um, instruments. There's the analog organic instrument, like a acoustic guitar, you know, Tibetan healing bowls, et cetera, the human voice, of course, And then there's software instruments, digital instruments, which are either recreating an acoustic instrument or they're a synthesized um, instrument all to themselves having their own unique kind of sound. And, you know, there used to be a big, big divide. I find I found, especially when I was younger growing up, where a lot of pure purists or certain musicians would definitely be like, oh, it's all about analog, no digital. We don't want that garbage. And then there's some people who are like, well, digital offers a lot of other benefits, though. And there's always been this kind of argument. I'd say nowadays the lines are way more blurry because digital and software instruments have become incredible in their quality and what they can offer. But then there's also that argument that you'll never get the same kind of thing um, that you do from the organic instrument. So maybe to kick it off, Bill, what's been your experience with software or digital instruments versus the real deal, the analog, the organic real deal. You know, I, I had a purist hat on for a long time, maybe up until the mid two thousands where if it wasn't an acoustic grand piano, I probably wasn't going to play. And then I had to do a concert where the acoustic piano that they had was so bad and they wouldn't put it on the stage. And it was just like this whole conflagration of things. And that was the concert where I had the the collision that I had spoke of in the last podcast we did, where the, the patches on the piano, instead of sounding like a natural grand, all of a sudden went to this ragtime honky-tonk sound in the middle of a climactic moment. And of course, you know, under my breath, I'm cursing the instrument. But there are times where you just, you know, you can't get a grand piano to wherever you want it. So I've been a purist. On the other side of that is the is the uh, improvement, I guess, in the sampled sounds that are available. And uh, in the 90s or something, where I was messing around with this for the first time, the sampled sounds of a uh, grand piano were pretty good. But there was a limitation because, and, and let's take a guitar, for example, because that's a little bit easier to grok than 88 strings or however many there are, you get those amazing overtones and the vibration of the other strings and of the instrument itself um, when you sample a note at a time. But how many multi-note musical instruments are out there 
that have a richness that comes from having all those notes available, even if they're not sounding per se. Uh, you strike a note on the guitar, if the other strings are, are unmuted, you'll get a resonance that comes from the other strings as well as the one that you've struck or plucked. And on a piano, that's magnified by a lot because there's a bunch more strings. So all of those great overtones and the richness of the thing and all of that disappear when you sample the instrument sounds and you've got to artificially put it back. And for, for most single line instruments, that's not a problem. You play one note at once, you get that, that's cool. But when you've got multiples of them, and that could affect percussionists as well, right? So your drums could be, or your cymbals could be vibrating at the same time, creating some ambience in the room. Um, all the string players, of course, have that to consider, whether you're playing violin, double bass, guitar, uh, piano. So there's, there's some part of this that is hard to catch, I guess is a good way of saying it. Even a voice, you're singing a, singing a single voice in an acoustically uh, padded room, you get a very clear tone. But you take that same voice and you put it in a cave or something, and you're going to want to capture that. And the resonance of the cave around that voice can be different than any other voice singing the same note, just because we're all different that way. So what do you do in those cases? And, and how do you reproduce you know, the most authentic sound uh, based on what it is that you're playing? So all of these become immense choices now. It's not just having like a, a Rhodes keyboard you know, with a mic in front of it or even a jack out, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's become much more complex and there's so many more things you can control right on the instrument. You've got your own reverb, your own echo. You can, in some, depending on the keyboard, uh, you've got a whole studio right there that you could use to modify the sound that you're making. Clearly not available on an acoustic grand. So uh, the, the complexity of choices has sort of gone through the roof too. And in many ways, the purist has it a little bit easier because <laughs> they only have to haul their grand piano out there and stick a couple of mics on it and you're good to go. Except of course, then we've got that whole thing about how do you properly mic a piano or how based on the concert that you're in, what is the mic configuration and the mics that you're going to use in the first place, right? How well, does that a, go? That's a grand piano. I mean, those aren't exactly the easiest to transport. That's the worst thing in the world to try to mic, you know? Yeah. Um, in fact, there's a great, uh, here we go back to NPR's Tiny Desk, but the guy who engineers that show um, has written, oh, volumes on what mics to use for what instruments, how to place them, whatever. It's a great resource if anybody's looking for a quick, you know, tour of how to mic an acoustic instrument. Would that it's be on there. the NPR website? I think it's, yeah, it's the NPR Tiny Desk website. And um, that's that's a great rabbit hole. There's all kinds of stuff wow. in there. And of course, their recording engineers are different than live performance engineers and there's all of that too, right? So the complexity of acoustic instruments doesn't really affect the player so much as it does the people who are trying to capture the performance. <laughs> so you can also offload true. your headaches, yep. <laughs> kick them upstairs. Yep. Right. <laughs> so I don't know, what, what is this long sort of rant about? Um, where do I stand on it? I think there's, I think if you have the choice that it's a marvelous choice to have because you can, you can say so much more than just your music if you're familiar with the tech and how to make that work in your favor too. And I think it's, um, you said it really well when it's like, it's a choice, you know, it's, it's more, it's not one is bad or, you know, different really. Well, they are different, but the, not one is not better than the other. It's purely a choice. And I think it's a matter of like with everything now that we have in the arts with so much technology at our fingertips, it's more of a question of what do you need right now? What's yeah. going to serve, what's going to serve the project the best and and what's going to serve and when i say project i mean not only the outcome that you're going for but the budget of course sure that is, that's definitely something that is a very realistic consideration and that's why digital and software instruments can sometimes be a really great alternative when there isn't as big of a budget because typically when you're going the organic uh, analog route it's, it's more typically, more generally going to be more expensive just because there's more time, labor, the equipment itself that you're going to be using is likely just more expensive because it's beautifully designed. There's the craftsmanship, there's the physicality to the equipment. Digital, once you design the instrument, once it's a digital download, you sell a million, billion, it doesn't matter. You don't have to have stock in that. It's a digital asset. Yeah. Um, so there's benefits, pros and cons to both. One of the, I used to be, I guess 
I was I was kind of opposite. Uh, I wasn't a purist. I was actually a, a technologist, let's say, is whatever the opposite of that would be. Um, I was more of a technologist because I was also really into um, the idea of sampling and what the really cool creative, um, well, creations that you could have come out of recording a sound, putting that sound into an instrument, transposing that sound over different key keys of that instrument or, or notes, and then not only playing that um, as an, its own instrument, but then manipulating that sound with other effects, with other things like that. You know, I remember when in my uh, university program, I only stayed in it for a year and a half and I, I dropped out, it just wasn't in alignment with me. But I did have a really cool class that was called Digital Media. And it was just about learning about synthesis and synthesizers and sampling instruments and digital instruments. And so we built one day as a part of our class, we built our own digital instrument. And so I sampled um, a violin actually. And instead of doing it the proper way, I, I did it the kind of quick and lazy way. But the weird thing was the quick and lazy way had a different sonic effect. It sounded way more synthesized, but it had its own kind of cool quality to it. And I remember writing a song with that instrument later and, and taking a step back and being like, no one else is going to create that sound that I just created. I, I just sampled my, I created my own sample digital instrument and you could say it's pretty bad because it doesn't sound really anything like a violin. But when I used it as just a general, just an instrument, forget what it's supposed to be. It's just creating sound and music. And I came up with some be really cool melodies and harmonies with that thing. So it's, it's all about how you use it. Uh, and, and, and with regards to that, I'd be curious to hear Bill, like what if, because I want to talk about this too, which is like, what are the healing aspects that you've been able to experience with both analog and digital? Because I oh feel like, you know, with digital, for example, like that's how you can dial in binaural beats way more effectively is with digital instruments. You go and literally buy the frequency and then dial in the specific binaural beat. So a clear, obvious benefit there. But then, for example, playing my acoustic guitar, the reverberation from the actual body of the instrument fills my my body my heart and everything with really good vibration. It feels so good. So what do you find like the healing aspects of this sort of divide of digital versus analog is? Gosh, I wish I had more experience on this. I'm, I don't appear in the world as a music healer, you know, um, but I have seen people respond very positively, both to digital and to analog, um, more experience with analog grand piano than anything else, acoustic grand. But there are times where you can't use that. And um, one of the projects I worked on, I couldn't move the piano. It just wasn't possible. So we did that project both ways and um, with equally good results. It was, uh, for, for folks who are familiar with how crazy stuff is in the world these days, we had a soprano who sang the words of Rumi over an improvised melody. Wow. Whatever it was that she wanted to choose. Beautiful. Backed up by a kind of a rhythm section with me on the keyboard, a bass player with an acoustic bass and an acoustic guitar. So um, it was kind of a, a wild, but not entirely out there uh, instrumentation. And when we gave the performance, uh, people, people were e equally moved either way. Uh, similarity of venues across, I mean, sort of like the control group was roughly the same, obviously different audiences, but people responded to it positively regardless of whether there was a grand piano in the room or a keyboard. It was a little bit easier to control everything because with the presence of a keyboard, you can then, you know, ride the levels on everybody and make sure that the live mix is actually sounding really good, where it isn't necessarily that easy to do it with a grand piano, which tends to overpower everything unless you can isolate it somehow by like closing it up and sticking the mics in places where they don't catch anybody else. And, you know, so there are ways around that. But um, I think the most satisfying performance for me was the one that was all acoustic. Because in that space, uh, there was no filter between our direct creation of the sounds and the audience's experience of them. I always feel like putting a, introducing technology in any way, whether that's just a PA or more some, something more complex like sampled sounds or background sounds or whatever, and just throwing all that into the mix. I always feel like that's, um, that introduces another level of separation between me and someone who's listening. Is that weird? And, no, and not at all. You know, I want that 
I want the connection to be as direct as I can, you know. Um, I even feel like that when I'm hitting a note on the keyboard, there's no uh, vibration in my fingernail or on the finger, my fingertip, depending on which part of the mm. of, of me is hitting the keys. Right. And I really miss that vibration because I know that that vibration is um, it helps me to control the sound I want, to modulate the sound, and um, it's kind of weird because after you hit the key, it's too late. <laughs> but if you if you break this down and you're getting some sort of consistency of vibration in your fingertips, you know that you're making uh, a legato passage. You know that it's 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 consistent with what you want, right? You can kind of tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that vibration is something that people are hearing as well. They're feeling that same vibration that I'm getting my fingertips in their ears. And um, for me, that's a more um, direct connection than introducing a PA on top of the piano even, because then whatever I'm playing might be experienced much differently by somebody who's sitting far enough away to catch only part of the vibrations, or maybe is sitting too close and they're getting more of the vibrational frequency than I want. You know, It's not about so much the note, it's about the feel like the, the actual uh, yeah, the, vibration the, on your skin. It's the feel. Yeah, and, and um, you can achieve that with a really great PA system, you know, like really great sound system can make people feel that. But there you are listening to it on the stage through monitors and it's a different thing, right? You kind of have to hope that whatever you were doing there was the right thing, you know, that the, you have to trust the sound system to be able to, um, to give that feeling to the audience. Closest I can get to that is um, I have one of those Bose sound towers and it's a pretty good system. If I'm sitting somewhere near it and the room is small enough, I can feel what they're feeling. And that's a, at least something like goodness for me when I have to use the keyboard. But oh gosh, is this getting anywhere close? <laughs> I yeah, I know. It's great, Bill. I think what you're, you're hitting on is, is really, it's really more of the analog benefits and the the things that will in my opinion never fully recreate with digital and it's not a negative or a positive it's just it just is yeah because we then get to use like for example my favorite thing to do is mix both of them together i, I love mixing right. both yeah so you know i'm having um a house concert tomorrow actually and uh i am mixing in a variety of live instrumentation uh, with an organic instrument, uh, crystal healing bowl, right. and and voice the human voice, of course. Uh, my my friend and myself will be singing, and then and then my piano is a digital piano. It's definitely one of the the best ones in terms of recreating the piano sound because I'm like yourself, a bit of a stickler, especially for a piano tone. And um, I play on the Nord Stage Three, and that is it's one of the only pianos, digital pianos, I played where I feel that similar set similar satisfaction. To playing the real deal and so now that we're mixing that digital instrument that's replicating an organic instrument and then on top of that i have a couple of background um, percussion electronic beats and also some synthesizer sort of background sound ambience that yeah. i'll be fading in for a couple of tracks as well so it's this mixture of all of those that i personally find i like the sound and the feel of that because i'm getting it i'm getting the best of of all of it if I had it my way, I, I would be playing a grand piano, of course, too. But there's also the, once again, the big benefit of digital is the practicality yeah. side of it. I simply don't have the setup to play an acoustic piano in my current apartment situation, which I'll be fixing in the new year. However, for now, I got to work with what I got. And so for those of you listening too, digital can usually be a very cost-effective and practical set up that it's better than nothing and you can find really good um you know emulations of these instruments but on the flip side you know there's nothing that is going to compare to the vibration of the keys when i play them on a grand piano like like bill was saying and also when i was mentioning too with the guitar like just to play an acoustic guitar have it on your body and feeling that vibration I mean, you'll never get that from a digital instrument because it's simply not how it's made, even yeah. when it comes through the speakers. And I, I mean, I, I have some amazing digital instruments that literally give me goosebumps and send me into the cosmos. Like they're so powerful and, and gorgeous and beautifully crafted. Yeah. So they are phenomenal, but I don't feel that same, and it's not better or worse, it's just different, but I don't feel that same physical resonance 
that I feel when I play like, let's say a guitar as an example, an acoustic guitar. So it's funny where, where some things, where some things lack in the acoustic or the organic side of things the I find digital and software instruments make up for it and vice versa. So I think we've mentioned this in previous podcasts with technology, but it's not like, you know, one thing is better than the other. I think we're in an age now where we're combining some ancient, ancient modalities with some extremely modern ones and blending those together. I, I, I believe is where you get new genres and new styles and new sounds. And it's a pretty fun pioneering experimental area. So I like the yeah, mixture of the two. I'm with you on this. I think the mix is what it is what matters. I would challenge anybody listening to you know pick some movies and decide whether the sounds you're hearing are by an authentic orchestra playing acoustic Ooh, instruments. Good experiment. Or generated from samples. And um, obviously for the big budget movies, they're gonna have you know bandwidth to be able to hire an orchestra. So pick something that's independent and see what you think uh, a buddy of mine loves to as a game like rescore uh short movies so mm -hmm. he'll watch it for the first time with no sound and then begin the process of rescoring it adding his own soundtrack to it and most of them are shorts because you know it's a huge project to score a movie huge, but huge. if you did it around a like a one act you can probably get it there and uh, that's an amazing creative endeavor. And it's also interesting to see what you can do um, with acoustic versus digital, if that's your thing. I mean, there's so many examples of software instruments now that you will never, ever be able to tell the difference. I mean, they're so, so bang on with, uh, and just some companies, if anyone's interested that's listening, like uh, the companies that I love that make, in my opinion, the most artistic software instruments, like they're, the way they craft them is it's it's real artistry. I mean, these are these are clearly musicians and artists who happen to be great software programmers and digital artists in a sense. And you could feel that artistry in the in the creation. So I think that's another myth with the digital software instruments is that it's, it loses its artistry. Well, that may have been the case back in the day, and some companies maybe still are like that. But for example, if you look at a company, one of my favorites called Spitfire Audio. Yeah, they are amazing with the software instruments that they develop. And these are companies that uh, are the top of the top, meaning, you know, Hans Zimmer to, um, you know, the rest like Howard Shore and the rest of the amazing composers that also compose for orchestras also use these software instruments for crying out loud. Hans Zimmer has his own brand of software instruments because Hans Zimmer, if we're going to look at him for a second, he was one of the pioneers with MIDI sampling. When Hans when Hans came onto the scene, he used to be in a pop rock band, a couple of other bands too. He was not a film score guy uh, when he started his career. So he when he got into film scores, he started to, being the creative guy that he is, he started to f figure out ways like, well, how can I emulate this sound without having to go and book time in the orchestra recording session, because we all know, I mean, that's extremely expensive to get an orchestra. I mean, every minute is probably thousands of dollars for crying out loud. So he got really inventive with that and was one of the pioneers with this idea of sampling and using what's called MIDI, M-I-D-I technology, which is a bunch of ones and zeros, computer information that typically will come from a keyboard that you're playing, it sends it to your computer and your computer will then translate that into whatever instrument you have selected. So Hans was at the forefront of that. And then of course takes that technology and then does all these cool things where he sometimes will write his scores all with software instruments and then re-records them with the real deal after. But because he was able to do a trial run with the software instruments, it gives him a good kind of ground or a base layer to then bring in and it's a little more cost effective too that way you can kind yeah. of demo something and then record it later um but then sometimes and he and he shows this many times in his master class if anyone watches or has heard of the master class series uh where they have literally all the, the greats in their respected field like martin scorsese teaches directing and natalie portman teaches acting and i think jane goodall even has a course on how to teaches uh, humanitarianism and environmentalism, I think. And anyway, uh, Hans Zimmer has his masterclass for film scores and I watched it and 
Wow. He, uh, he can really articulate and break down the art and the process of writing film uh, music for film in a way I've never heard before, to be honest. It was really refreshing. And one of the things he was showing was just how sometimes he really will write with these software instruments and they will, they'll make the final cut because no one can tell. The, the director, like Christopher Nolan, will come in and just be like, Oh, when did you record that? And he's like, I, I mean, I didn't. It's, it's a yeah, software instrument. Software instrument. And he's like, great, leave it in. Like, no one's going to know. So it's it's pretty interesting. You know, other companies too, Native Instruments is another uh, huge company that does really good software instruments. And the third one I'll mention is uh, Heaviosity. Heaviosity specializes, although not solely, but they have two really, really fascinating instruments. One's called Damage. It's an amazing percussion instrument. And it's it takes percussion, especially for film scores and video game soundtracks, it takes it to a whole other level purely because that's what you can do when you work with software instruments is you can layer so many sounds into one sound. Yeah. And that's and then and then tweak it and they have all these cool parameters for you to do that. And then they have another really really fascinating instrument called Vocalize, where they do emulate the human voice. And it has to be one of the better human voice emulations I've ever heard. But the cool thing, too, about this is that they also will, yes, you can have the natural sound, but they also have these really cool pads, they call them, that morph the human voice with synthesis and other, you know, reverb trails of the voice that they then re-loop them and create a whole new sound out of that. And it creates like this angelic, atmospheric, etheric sound that you couldn't create any other way. So yeah. I love nerding out on this because this this kind of stuff, I'll sometimes find myself in a, a rabbit hole at midnight looking up different software instruments. I mean, they're endless. New ones coming out every day. So it's a little dangerous <laughs> if you're like me, especially <laughs> on the Black Friday weekend that came up recently. And I was like, oh, no, don't give me 50% off on like all of Hans Zimmer's instruments. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> How about um, the frequencies we can't hear or even the ones we can? Uh, I've always been, you know, as a purist, concerned about what's added in to the mix later. But these days it's happening in real time, like your 40 hertz recording uh, or any of the binaural beats that are now available to everybody. And there's actual recorded music with binaural beats in it or behind it, you know, like original music. Uh, this creates the whole opportunity for maybe music with that high frequency stuff that we can't hear that interferes with the growth of cancer. Mm. Right? And the idea here is not that the music itself is really doing the work. The music is sort of like the background, if you will, for the, for the operational thing that's happening, the binaural beat or the cancer curing high frequency stuff that we can't hear or the 40 Hertz stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, it's kind of nice if you can hear it like a 40 Hertz to have something interesting going on around it. But theoretically, you could put a binaural beat or the right frequencies on top of anything, and it'd have the same effect, even if the music was the opposite of the binaural beats or the right frequencies intent. You know, theoretically, it will work, <laughs> and that's awesome because it means that somebody who you know like wants to chill can get their chill frequency out of a binaural beat, whether that's layered over running water or Mozart or ACDC. Right, it can have the same effect physiologically. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for me, that's really cool because it says, okay, I can play like, you know, Chopin. And if I stuck a binaural below it or a right frequency in it or whatever, it would completely change the purpose of the music. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And in, and in some cases in ways that people don't hear. <laughs> and I, I actually love that. The, the more subtle ways of, of, uh, affecting people, right. With, those yeah, right but, but do we need a disclaimer now? Ooh, that's a very good question, Bill. Right? I mean, <laughs> I there, I, there are music therapists out there, I kid you not, there are music therapists out there who are so diligent about the preservation of the music therapy ethos that if you even so much as advertise that you're doing anything healing with music, they will jump at you. Now, it's mm. not so much anymore. You have to use the word therapy to really get there. Yes. But... Um, but they're defending the space, right? And if you are someone who gives yourself healing with music, you know, that's that's riding the line of therapy. I guess. It's such a funny thing. It's because it's it's they're learning it through an orthodox 
educational system because it's now being taught. Music therapy is now taught in school. Yeah. So there's a process to go through. Um, my my ex-girlfriend who uh, is a music therapist, we still stay, stay in contact. She's a lovely, wonderful human being. And she's taken that pursuit of music therapy through school. So she's a trained music therapist. And I remember uh, not too long ago having a conversation with her and I'm like, so um, so what kind of like binaural beats do you typically give to your patients? And her answer was binaural beats. And I was like, yeah, like uh -huh. binaural beats. She's like, what are those? I'm like, oh my God, you never got taught about binaural beats at all in your music therapy program. She's like, not once. Nope. I mean, and she had some other things to say about that program, but I mean, at the end of the day, I don't want to bash music therapy at all and slash the, the programs they're so it's so nice to see that that's actually something being studied and taken seriously now. So I'm all about that. However, when they, if there are those that jump on other people like myself and Bill for putting our, uh, our other forms of music healing out into the public, that's where I start to want to open up a larger discussion because, yes. Yes. because we need to, because if, if, for example, it's a two-way street. If you and me are putting frequencies into our music that now we still have disclaimers. I always say, do your own research and especially listening to binaural beats. If you're epileptic or you're pregnant, those specifically, I've heard time and time again that you do want to be careful with that. So of course, I mean, we mentioned that we, I have my disclaimers and I'm always doing my best to make sure no one's going to get hurt by my healing music, <laughs> which is kind of a crazy thing to think about sometimes, but it's anything's possible. So it's like, I would love to learn from the Orthodox um, and from the, the music therapists, you know, what are those harmful frequencies perhaps? And how can I avoid using them? Or what should I be aware of? Like, I would love to know more about that, but then vice versa, if they don't know what binaural beats are, Oh my God, <laughs> like, right? you were missing out on such a huge area of healing. Yes. We got to educate people more on that. Well, we, and, and we are, I'm, and I don't think anybody who's doing music for healing is trying to take business from a music therapist. No, God like no. a music therapist is a, it's a therapeutic relationship with a certified credentialed individual that understands how music can be applied to solve your problems. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's fine. Although I also think it's a little bit. It, it overreaches because music therapy is largely confined to the clinical space. They do yeah. work, of course, with folks who are going through end of life and the families and whatever. So there's some supportive things in there too. And that's kind of where we cross over, where healing music and music therapy kind of cross over or blend. Mm. But uh, for a preacher to stand up in front of everybody and say, let's sing this healing hymn that could be perceived as music therapy. Because yes. the preacher in, advised the congregation that healing was coming related to music. Right. And, and that's not a line that anybody wants to have to draw for, let alone, you know, try to police it. It's ridiculous. No. On the, on the other side of that though, there's so many people who are doing healing things with music that it'd be kind of nice if music therapy kind of opened the envelope and said, Oh, and by the way, here's all this other stuff that's available too. Exactly. And, and recognized that sound healing is a thing, right. And that it does work. And, but that hasn't happened yet at least in America, and, and that there's ways that you can give yourself a musical healing experience that doesn't involve a therapist. And they're valid and they work, yeah. you know? But um, for music therapy to, to be where it is right now, it has to stay in the funding track. And the funding track is only available to scientific research and blah, 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 which means you're in the clinical space. And uh, until somebody gets the funding to evaluate why a singing bowl is so incredibly powerful for healing reasons, um, you know, I, I, I don't know we're going to get on the radar when it comes to that, right? We're going to need some private funding, I think, Bill. <laughs> we're going to need some private money, yes. Hey, anyone listening, uh, want to give us a couple mil and we'll go do a whole bunch of research for you? Yeah, That'd we'll, be great. we'll do double blind studies on singing bowls or whatever it is. I mean, there's so much. Binaural beats, for crying aloud. We need more information on that. We need more information on um, all the, the healing frequencies, right? That, yep. Like these rife frequencies. We've got to dig more into that. For those listening... Right frequencies, and uh, actually, Bill, you're probably going to know more about this than me, but from what I know more, it's less, I don't actually, I'm not as familiar with the specific frequencies. All I know is that Royal Raymond Rife invented an incredible microscope back in the early 1900s, and it was the most powerful of its kind, and he was able to view things on a microscopic level that we hadn't seen before. 
and was able to see that what we know in quantum physics is vibrating strings and vibrating um, electrons, everything's in a state of vibration. So when he was able to view this on a microscopic level, he realized that, oh, well, everything's in vibration. Therefore, if I send other vibrations or frequencies to these cells, I should be able to manipulate them. If I find the resonant frequency of that cell, he did, and then uh, ended up <laughs> kind of curing everything that he came across because he could go on a cellular level, manipulate that cell th via frequency, and then have a positive outcome. So he, I believe, kept a whole uh, book and a catalog of all these frequencies, the rife yeah. frequencies. Thousands of them. Thousands Which, of by them. by the way, were made with a tone generator, right? So not an, not oh, an acoustic okay. instrument, mm. right? Because, you know, you're talking about frequencies we can't hear. So they had to have an associate. I don't know what they would produce that stuff with back in the day, crystal radio, but they could, they could predetermine the frequency create it and you know and then make it work so some kind of a analog oscillator that produced the sound was was the way he had to do it he didn't have a, a piano or anything that could play those high notes no of course not because it's, it's, <laughs> it's far beyond the twenty thousand hertz you know ceiling that we have for our hearing but it doesn't mean that those frequencies of course don't exist they do and and when they're applied they did miraculous things um, then, of course, the whole conspiracy over Mr. Reif is then his gear was all confiscated and yeah. he disappeared. And They swept Reif and Tesla away and who else? Who else? So many <laughs> others because we're, we don't even remember because they're, they're lost in history. Yeah, you know, it's what happens when you innovate things and help people. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, we can't well, have that. <laughs> so that uh, you can't watch this. Everybody who's listening, Chris's backdrop today is the pyramids, the Great Pyramids of Giza. And um, they're resonators as well. So somebody somewhere inside of history was able to determine that there was something really important about sound inside those babies. Mm -hmm. And um, and for whatever reason, with the scientific, the technology they had at the time that they could build them with, they also had technology that was able to identify healthy effects from using them. Yeah. And sometimes, well, what I've heard from certain researchers doing acoustic research at the Great Pyramid is that the pyramid itself resonates at the frequency of, wait for it, 432 hertz. <laughs> there we go. Right, so circling back around. Yeah, which is an uh, incredibly healing frequency. The interesting thing too about that, which is it gets a little bit into numerology and uh, mathematics, which I, I wasn't really into as a kid, but later in life I was like, oh my God, it's fascinating stuff. And you know, 432, if you add four plus three plus two, it equals nine. And then if you look at the Great Pyramid, the number nine and the number three and the number six come up constantly when you're when you're talking about the ratios of the pyramid and the the measurements and if you you break everything down into ratios um the great pyramid explodes with mathematics it's incredible even the royal cubit which is the ancient measurement system has uh, a very uh physical um effect uh, i've seen other companies that actually say that they measure things in the royal cubit because the royal cubit had a very sacred geometrical uh, I can't find the words for it because it's obviously we don't use this technology today, but it had a very, it was a measurement system that had a very strong rele relevance to uh, the organic geometry we find in our world. And so when they built with that, they're building these resonant chambers. And if when I was inside the Great Pyramid, I mean, talk about a resonant chamber. The King's Chamber is designed to reverberate sound. I mean, your voice carries forever, and it's not that big of a room, but uh, they're clearly re re resonating chambers. And we know the the power that comes with with resonance, especially at a large scale. I mean, those kind of vibrations can do incredible things, and they can do very, very destructive things too. I mean, regardless, it's very powerful. And the last thing I'll say, we, you mentioned Tesla, one of my absolute favorites. It's amazing that we don't get taught about Nikola Tesla in, in, in history at all, at all. I never once learned about him in school, yet he's single-handedly probably the greatest scientist of the 20th century. And, um, and, and regardless, one of the quotes that I love of his is he's like, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, you have to think in terms of frequency, vibration, and resonance. And his other quote that I also loved that dives deeper into the numerology is that if you want to learn um, similar kind of quote, I'm probably mixing them up a little bit, but basically if you want to learn the secrets of the universe, 
think in terms of three, six, and nine. The numbers three, six, and nine have a lot of power and a lot of creation power and a lot of interesting correlations to geometry and all this other stuff. So it's funny that those numbers come out of the Great Pyramid all the time. A lot of ancient structures, those numbers come out all the time. And then with music and the music of the spheres and all these other kind of ancient but pretty incredible musical healing um, almost rules or formulas that we've encountered all seem to re- resemble these similar mathematics, three, six, and nine, 432 hertz, and the spheres that these musical um, scales can make to create sort of circular patterns. And it's uh, it's endless. I could keep going on about this forever, but it's fascinating stuff. <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. Somebody somewhere has got to have written all this down and combined it with uh, harmonic theory, how you can measure overtones and things like that. Mm. I'd love to find some white paper on. If you're listening to that and you know of one, send me there because th- there are a lot of people who are doing th- who are thinking about this and how everything combines and how it all works, mm. and trying to make some correlations on it. And uh, that's pretty phenomenal to me. Um, one of the ones that I love the most has really nothing to do with music, but it is mathematical in the sense that the scientists working on quantum gravity have decided that our world that we see, this three-dimensional thing is basically something like the cube root of the real world. Wow. So if the real world is eight dimensional, for example, or the real universe or whatever it is, then we are the cube root or two, the 3D world. So it's like our, and I don't know how this pans out, but here we are in 3D, two cubed is eight. So 8D (laughs) would be like the the ultimate mathematical end. And I don't know if it ends there. It might go on. Yeah, I've heard you know? 13 at least. Right. Uh, right. If not more. So um, the quantum gravity people are working with eight dimensions of, um, I guess, quantum holographic understanding. Holographic reality. Cause... Holographic reality, yeah. The simulation awesome. theory, all of that comes together. It's, I mean, it's pretty weird, but it's out there. And it's science. This is not uh, philosophy science. or it's, spirituality right now. This that's is, just mathematics. I know. Um, and and the, the cool thing about quantum gravity is it kind of explains where Einstein gave up. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, well, relatively works great until you until it doesn't. And the, the bend, the curve that Stephen Hawking gave us um, explains black holes. And it also explains why Einstein's theory of general relativity needs to be adjusted, you know, for where it doesn't work right. And I suspect that there's something about that in the way that we tune instruments so that they sound right. Mm. You know, if you tune the perfect interval all the way from one end of the keyboard to the other, by the time you started to play it, it'd be kind of, kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's an art. There's an art to this curve that artists and specifically piano tuners understand, mm. but that science is having a hard time explaining because it's, you know, it's off at the margins, right? Yeah. It doesn't quite make sense in that typical traditional sense that yeah. way, right? But it feels right. It feels right. To the artist. So well, why doesn't this all work the way it's supposed to? And then it sounds so terrible when you play on it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> What's up with that? And then you do it a little differently and you just hear and listen to it and just kind of go by ear and all of a sudden it sounds great. But mathematically, or at least in terms of how you set it up, that tuning, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. But if it were perfect, it wouldn't work. So if you're looking for the perfect healing at our little sort of basic level of grabbing onto things, yeah, we can say 40 Hertz is pretty good. And some of those right frequencies are pretty good, but it's more about the blend. How do you get to the blend, right? Right. Where it becomes a satisfying musical experience as well as one that's therapeutic. That's a good point too. You know, I mean, you could, you probably prevented from using the right frequencies as a music therapist, but wouldn't that be the ultimate thing to use? (laughs) <laughs> right instead of mucking around with all of this you know sort of middle ground of the way that music is and works and whatever and what's the genre you need whatever forget that man if you've got cancer it's this frequency just do it boom done honestly i mean you've I've, there's a ted talks um, and i think there's multiple ones that show um there's so many oh, it's so frustrating anyway lots of cures for cancer that i've seen on the web yeah. and uh, a lot of them involving frequency one gentleman on a TED Talks about seven, eight years ago shattered cancer cells, leukemia cells specifically with yep. sound. Uh, a lot of people have seen that one. 
I've looked into his research. Um, you would think, you would, you would think <laughs> curing cancer would get you a little bit of pub publicity, would get a little bit of excitement, would get just a tiny bit of some form of follow-up after a TED Talks that went viral, several million views, you know, you would think. Turns out his research has been abandoned, no more funding, can't make it happen. How many times does this happen? And I'm not gonna get into the conspiracies, that's not this podcast, but when we're talking about incorporating the right frequencies into our music, I, I, I have to like make the joke of like, well, I think if I ever start doing that, I might get a, a knock at my door from the men in black or something. <laughs> hey, don't say anything and just do it. Yeah, say, just do say it. music that heals cancer and then have your disclaimer and then just put it out there and see what happens. Well, yeah. I mean, what's the worst thing? It just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And guess what? You're in the same position as you were before. Oh no. Like it's just like you were listening to any other piece of music then at that point, you know, like, right. How bad could it really be? And that, that's the nice thing too with music therapy is like how how bad can the uh, you know repercussions really be from a, a failed experiment? You know, oh no, it just didn't work. Okay, yeah. Oh well, we're at you know same place where we started. The the reverence we have uh, for music in the West when it comes to these applications is sort of guided by our scientific sense of things too. And um, I just read this fascinating book where the author, who is a near death experience expert was invited to talk in, um, actually, I, was it in Tibet? No, it was in India at the time. The Dalai Lama convened this conference of physicists and monks, basically, to talk about things and the crossovers and stuff. Cool. And yeah, it sounds like a great thing to present, but yeah. he, he, after the thing was over, he said to this author, you know, in the West, you're all about power and control and use science to be able to control things. And that's totally different than the way it is in the East. I, I, the East admires silent science for its ability to come close to what the East already knows, right? So the monks are already in possession of this information. They know mm -hmm. that, you know, and they look with, with sort of curiosity at science and how it's able to approach their, I hate to say it's religious knowledge, but their, their spiritual sense. Spiritual knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Like the fundamental sense of what is. And, um, it's like the, the scientists in the West are trying to find ways to, to do compassion and love and, you know, all of that through scientific means. And mm. it's, it's kind of, it, I guess eventually it'll be doable. But the other side of that is why aren't you just being loving and compassionate, <laughs> right? Because we know that works. We know it works. We, we, we know it from a fundamental level. We do have even science that, that confirms that now, too. Oh, absolutely. Sure. I mean, but we all know the science of gratitude. Exactly. Like we have science that confirms that typically led by scientists that have a heart, more heart-based approach to life usually. Yes. And you can see that a lot of those, the scientists that do do the work in these areas that are, are certainly much less, po like these are, there is science being done, but there's not a lot of it. It's not like mainstream. Yeah. Um, but the people that are doing it are, when you look at their, um, their history and just kind of who they are, they're almost always very, very spiritual people. So they have their own spiritual practices. They come yeah. from uh, maybe a lineage of that or, or a culture that reveres that more. Um, you know, the, um, like, for example, the, the, the Japanese um, scientists who uh, I just hadn't pulled up here, Dr. Masaru oh, the, Imoto. Yeah, the ice guy. The ice guy. Oh, um, the yes, the ice guy. The his book being. Um, uh, I'm just getting the audio book for it. Blanking out at the history of water or. Um, right, right. He, he first the sort hidden of got, messages in water. That's it. Yes. Yeah, and uh, he would be a great example of someone who's done amazing work on the science of emotions, and and how emotions literally change our cells in our body. Our phys the physiological makeup of our entire body sh shifts based on our emotions, and he has scientific proof for this. But you look into Dr. Emoto a little bit more, and you're like, oh, of course he's been doing this research because he's a pretty spiritual guy. And he does come from, of course, the East, and you know those ancient Eastern traditions do still really venerate and, and have a lot of respect for the spiritual teachings, whereas I find nowadays we maybe at best tolerate the spiritual teachings and wisdoms and then wait for science to just be the ultimate, you know, dictator on what is real, what's not. And, yeah. what, and w rather than listening to how we feel 
and our emotional intelligence. You know, we're always waiting for an external source to validate our feelings. When in the Eastern culture, it's like, hey, if you feel it, you feel it. So <laughs> that's all that matters. That's the cool thing about music is that it speaks not only to the neuroscience, what's happening in the brain, but to the heart science, mm. you know, and in a certain sense, I think to the gut science too, because we all talk about feeling music in our gut, you know, yeah. those, so neuroscience, great. You've got two thirds of it down, great, go for it. But when it comes to actual healing and vagus nerve stuff and all of that, um, we're going deeper, you know, um, we got to speak to all of the bacteria that are in our bodies, mm. you know, and get them all lined up and flying the same in the same formation, that kind of stuff. So, you know, at the end of the day, isn't it all about intention, whether you bring an acoustic instrument or an electronic one, the intention is really the thing that's going to work. And we could argue about, you know, the effect on whatever the, the scientific measurements of the instruments in one way or another. But if you, if you're coming with intention and the intention is healing, it doesn't matter whether you're playing on a kazoo or a Stradivarius, <laughs> right? That's true. Or a keyboard that mimics those. Uh, because the intent is the thing that's going to carry the day. And, you, and your intent <laughs> to provide healing and the person who wants the healing to align with that, uh, music is just sort of a vehicle that connects you at that moment, right? The intention because is so key. The intention is key. And we, we don't measure any of that stuff yet. We just know that music has something to do with it, Right. It's like saying that music all happens in the brain. The way that you understand all happens in the brain. No, way, way outside the brain because, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have these amazing experiments of quantum physics that have nothing to do with the brain and absolutely everything to do with something else, right? So, uh, hey, you know, music, great. If, if, if chopping carrots is healing for you, great, you know, do that. <laughs> washing dishes. You know, washing dishes. I mean, yeah. the, that intent is so incredibly pure. And we have lots of history on this. I mean, just read about the miracles of Jesus. Mm. And magic. You know, if you look into magic in, in Egypt, I mean, that's the birthplace of magic. We laugh at magic now because of Harry Potter and other, I mean, I love, I love Harry Potter, but. Um, yep, likewise. Yeah, but, uh, but, you know, it's been pop culture has really turned magic into whatever we've turned it into but magic at the end of the day is is essentially it's technology that we can't explain it's phenomenon that we can't explain we just slap on a label of magic and if you look back into what magic really was for the ancients it's attention with intention and specific words said a specific way potentially melodically or not and that intention is so important if you actually look at the translation of abracadabra, it's it means as I speak, I create. And so magic quite literally is, is, is intention. And it's other things involving intention, but at the end of the day, the core foundation is intention to do something and a very deep intention. And then that intention is focused with attention and other means and other rituals to really focus you in. I've heard some people that specialize in magic talk about it in a way where they're like, look, the only reason rituals even exist is because it helps you get into the state of consciousness to be able to focus 100% of your mind on that one thing. Think about it. How difficult is it to focus your mind on anything nowadays? It's oh, impossible. literally impossible. Yeah. So to be, you know, to really focus in your, your attention to that degree, you can... We don't even know what we could accomplish because we can barely, we can't replicate it right now. Our, our brains are so frazzled with so many things going on that we're, we're racing at a million miles a minute and we're only retaining like 10% of what's happening in our own brain. There's so much going on. <laughs> the, the toe in the pool is using music to relax because at least in that state, you know that you want something and you know the music can take you there. And it's a great example, although it's such a weak one, of how aligning our intention and our attention is something that music does for us. Yeah. You know, but maintaining that focus, I mean, it's really hard. Unless you're a performing musician, which there are probably a few out there listening to this, it's really tough for anyone else in the world to bring their focus to something for even a few seconds, let alone for an hour's performance or two hours performance. Yeah. I mean, that is a high degree of focus that just doesn't exist in a lot of the world. No. It's everything is so fractured anymore, but music can give you that if you're willing to surrender to it. It's a really good point, Bill, because I just had the thought too of anyone listening, you know, the, one of the benefits for learning an instrument, you don't have to be a musician, but you can, you can learn an instrument anytime you want. 
one of those benefits is that you get sucked into it and you really find you'll find yourself concentrating a lot on on that and you might find moments of complete and like you'll know you've been concentrating very heavily and very focused on something when you kind of kind of pop out of it all of a sudden you go whoa yeah what happened to the last half an hour what happened to the last three hours yeah. that's when you know you've really gone to a flow state and you're really focusing in on something music's great for that learning an instrument what a great way to get into that flow amazing state. i got to work with guitars for vets when they were new um, sort of facilitating chapters formation and you could watch that happen I mean, veterans that wanted to intervene with post-traumatic stress would pick up a guitar and for a period of time, they would be stress-free, right? It's so you beautiful. know it can be done, right? While you're mm. playing, the, you know it can be done, but it can be done anywhere with any, with any sort of modality that you want, fly fishing, MMA, whatever it turns out. There are a lot of modalities Absolutely. where you focus. Yes. Uh, it changes everything. And uh, also referring to this book, which I should probably say is called Awake, and okay. uh, it's by Dr. Grayson, I believe is his name. In any case, um, the effect of a near-death experience on the experiencers is that they come back with this ability to enjoy things that are even annoying, like tinnitus, which I have. Um, one of the people said, it's just wonderful to hear that sound in my ears in a way that I had never experienced before. And it's just, you know, even the bad stuff seems to take on a new life and to remind you of your focus and intention of being here. And um, it just, it, it, it's remarkable what we can do as musicians to, uh, to manipulate at a distance. But what's even more remarkable is when you understand how to do that for yourself mm -hmm. and that the music you love is doing that for you. So why not engage more? Uh, a Tibetan bowl player that I'm working with uh, likes to say intention plus attention equals manifestation. Yeah, magic. And that's your yeah. abracadabra right there, right? That's it, that's it. As, as a man thinketh, so he is, right? <laughs> but a lot yeah. of people have gotten on, on board this. And then of course the guide for that is, you know, do for others what you would not want them to do for you. The good old golden rule that exists in so many of those religious traditions mm -hmm. is all mm -hmm. about how to live this way, like with a reason on purpose, because it works. Yeah. You know, it works better than anything else we know. Uh, whether that's for health or wealth or happiness or, you know, keeping the tiger outside the cave while you're all inside. Mm hmm. You know, there's so much that's just fundamentally basic in this. And we're not the first. Uh, the Egyptians probably got that. Um, Plato wrote some pretty good dialogues back in the day that are pre uh, our arguments these days mm -hmm. by a lot. I don't know how many thousands of years that was ago. A couple. <laughs> you know, so, there, you know, it's there. It's, it's available. And, um, hey, we have great ways of being able to reproduce sound now that didn't exist in... in greco-roman times or egyptian times absolutely but the effect is the same because it's the intention that matters you know it brings it full circle bill because we were talking at the beginning of this podcast about digital versus analog instruments and one of the best things about both and i, I this this applies to both is that we now have a great opportunity as humans and and i really put this out to anyone who's who doesn't consider themselves a musician listening this is a great opportunity to start creating your own healing music or learning a, an instrument. And that instrument could literally be um, an acoustic instrument like a guitar or uh, a piano, or it could be software, which means you're probably going to learn the piano and then use the digital keyboards to play every other instrument under the sun. And what you can do with these things now, whether it's acoustic or not, it doesn't matter, but you throw it onto a program like GarageBand lay down a couple of really simple layers, a couple of like one or two tracks of your instrumenta in instrumentation and let your feelings guide you. Just play some notes. Ooh, that feels good. Mm, don't like that. Mm, don't like, oh, that feels good. Like let that be your guidance system for writing. And then maybe throw your voice on top, maybe not, whatever. And then just see how you feel afterwards having, you know, gotten all that out. And, and even if you don't like the end product, it's the process of writing, the process of, of creating that music and making those sounds with those instruments. That's where you're going to find yourself in that flow state. That's where you're going to find yourself really losing track of time in the best way possible because you're focused. You, you have your full attention on something. And with the intention of healing yourself, guess what? You're definitely going to do something really positive for yourself. Even if you don't like the outcome of the piece you've written, the process of doing it is so important, so healing. And thankfully, 
whether you have access to an acoustic analog instrument like a piano, guitar, healing, singing bowl, your own voice, or software instruments like any software, basically any computer you have now, I guarantee you if you pull up one of the programs like a GarageBand, now you have access to what we're calling software instruments on that program. So literally, you can go into your laptop with nothing else, just your keyboard, write in a couple of notes with your mouse or your, your keyboard on your actual laptop, which you can do very, very easily. Boom, you've got a song. Just go through that see how that feels because i guarantee you it's the process that brings the attention the intention and all the healing modalities that come with it yeah yeah what a what a wonderful way to wrap this up i i, I love that you said that it's about the journey because that more than anything else is where attention and intention focus it's not on having some final product no. That's nice, but sometimes, as you pointed out, it could be crap, you know? <laughs> and, and it doesn't hey, matter. That's fine. Because, you know, back in the day when, when coding was new, people did the most banal things with computers because they could. They were understanding how it all worked. And the process of creating music is so simple anymore. Like, I, I did a thing on my iPad the other day with GarageBand. I was like, wow, this is cool. And, and the iPad on... The iPad version of GarageBand is much more capable than the one that comes on the computer. Yeah. It's really crazy. Yeah. Sounds, everything, it's all there. I know. It's great. And uh, it's, a, it's a go for it. Like compose some music and, and get back to us on what it's like. Share it if you want to. Love to hear what you're working on. But Absolutely. more importantly, I think, um, is how you got there. I know people talk about the tyranny of the how, but I'm really interested in how that went, like the process. Mm -hmm. That's the how. Did you how did you do that <laughs> to use yeah. a word? Everyone no, but, has a different process. Bring it back and, and talk about how your intention and attention work through that thing. We know why you want to do it. It doesn't really matter so much what the outcome is, but, but the walk, you know, that's what matters. The Tao. I love that. <laughs> Well, I think we could just end it off there, Bill, because uh, yeah. it feels like we've come full circle nice and organically, analog-wise. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think uh, for everyone listening, just experiment. I think that's really what we're getting at, to have some fun with your own musical creations, and um, especially because of the ease of technology and what we have access to, it, it's more of an opportunity for us to experiment in the ways that our ancestors couldn't experiment. Uh, and they did it their own way, but now we have our our new way of doing it. And why not run with that? You know, yeah. have fun with that. Yeah. And fun is good. We like fun. We love fun. I don't think I got into music because it was mundane. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work if you want to be good at it. But it's a lot of work, so you better be having fun. <laughs> exactly. We don't work our instruments. We play them. So. Oh yeah. Right. Good point. Thank you for listening in on our conversation and for taking time to show your appreciation with a like, share, or subscribe. Discussions of music, healing, and consciousness is a practice of spontaneity, and we welcome your comments, ideas, and questions. There are ways to connect with us in the show notes, so let us hear from you. Until next time, this is Bill Protzman along with Chris Noble wishing you great musical health. Samara Huchaya. Thank you.